Welcome to the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. I am Club President Darren Miller, President and Owner of JM Construction. As we gather virtually today for our 18th program in our club's 108th year history, we'll continue the tradition of saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we begin the program today, we have just a bit of club business. But first, uh, Francis Vogel, direct, de Development Director of the Adult Learning Center, will give our invocation. Today we mourn the passing and celebrate the legacy of U.S. Representative and Civil Rights legend, John Lewis. We also pause to note our continued struggle with the coronavirus. On March 13, Brother Richard Hendrick, a Capuchin Franciscan, posted a powerful poem on Facebook about the pandemic. Here's the conclusion of lockdown. Wake to the choices you make as to how to live now. Today, breathe. Listen, behind the factory noises of your panic, the birds are singing again. The sky is clearing, spring is coming, and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul, and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. Thank you, Francis. Next, John Ferguson, Business Development Director at Findorf, has an announcement about our upcoming Rotary Club of Milwaukee Scholarship Golf Classic. Thank you, President Darren. Just thrilled to be with you all this morning, or I guess afternoon at this point, to give you the one uh, month reminder of our Rotary Scholarship Golf Classic. Uh, the group has done an amazing job um, filling up foursomes. We actually only have one left um, <clears throat> and two additional single spots if anybody's uh, interested in getting involved with golf. We're also looking for a few more silent auction items. Um, if anyone has anything to offer, please contact myself or Michelle or Mary. For those of you that don't want to golf, but do want to network and fellowship with your fellow Rotarians, um, we're going to be having an outdoor, socially distanced happy hour uh, starting at 5.30. It's on August 31st uh, after the round of golf, and it's at the Wisconsin Club Country Club. So we're hopeful that many of you will take the opportunity to get outside, see your fellow Rotarians, and come support a great event. Um, we're raising a, a significant amount of money for our 24 uh, Rotary Scholars and would love to have you participate on that day. So thanks so much. Any questions, feel free to email myself or Mary or Michelle or my co-chairs, uh, Chris Corley or Patrick Fennelly. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Tomorrow, Rotary is partnering for a Newsmaker Lunch with the Milwaukee Press Club and Wispolitics.com. Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin will be featured as the guest at this virtual event. You must register in advance and those who register will get a link at the morning of the event to view it live. See the link in our email today or contact Michelle to register. We'd like to say thank you to Alex Cho for his help in arranging last week's snack program with John Johnson from Marquette University Law School, who talked about the important shift in owner-occupied housing in our community. That program is now live on our YouTube channel. Also, Rotary and the Florentine Opera are co-hosting the Quarantine Opera Book Club, which is Friday, uh, sorry, Wednesday nights at 5 p.m. A cocktail idea is provided. This week, the opera is joined by French composer Jules Massenet. If you'd like to join, please email Michelle or visit the link in this morning's program. We know that people are continuing to miss the face-to-face -face, face -face conversations, and we're working on ways to incorporate uh, more interaction into our Tuesday programs. So if you're joining us on Zoom today, when we get to the Q&A portion of the program, we'll change the format so the program will be able to be viewed uh, amongst our fellow audience members. Please switch to gallery view and you'll be able to see the audience. Also continue uh, to chat your submission questions during that time. After the program ends, we'll stick around on Zoom and be able to continue the conversation throughout. 
Next, Chris Hendricks, Emeritus per Director of the Wisconsin Policy Forum, will introduce our speaker. But first, I think Chris has a few comments about next week's SNAP program. Um, before I introduce the uh, speaker, um, I want to tell you a little bit about our snack program for this week. We thought it would be a lot of fun to get to know President Darren. So on Thursday at noon, fellow Rotarian Mary Bolich will interview him. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mary is a former journalist. So she, uh, this is right up her alley. Uh, we expect it to be a lighthearted and uh, have a lot of fun with it. So be sure to join us at noon, live on Zoom, or if you can't make it, check out the program in our YouTube channel, which will be uploaded on Thursday afternoon. So now I get to go to the introduction of our speaker. Uh, Ro Rotarian Rob Hankin is the president of the Wisconsin Policy Forum, a position he's held since 2008. Since joining the forum, Rob has authored or co-authored five reports that won national awards from the Government Research Association. He was uh, also honored last year as our own Rotary Club's 2019 Person of the Year and also received the 2019 Ally Award from the Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee. Earlier, Rob was named one of Milwaukee's 100 most influential leaders in the Milwaukee Business Journal's annual Power Book in 2012 and one of Milwaukee's Game Changers by M Magazine in 2013. Um, it's no wonder that I'm very proud to have been on the selection committee when, uh, when Rob was hired. Before he became forum president, Rob worked in Milwaukee County government for nearly 10 years, serving as director of research for the county board, director of health and human services, and director of administrative services. He also worked for seven years on Capitol Hill as a senior aide to two congressmen and as staff director for House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Subcommittee. The Wisconsin Policy Forum, for those who are unfamiliar with it, is Wisconsin's premier nonpartisan public policy think tank. Get that again, premier nonpartisan. Policymakers rely on the forum for objective, fact-based policy research and citizens depend on it for the straight scoop on contentious policy issues. I was privileged to serve for many years on the forum's board and as its vice chair for several years. I'm still proud to be an emeritus director. In March, when the COVID-19 crisis broke, the forum shifted basically on a dime to an almost exclusive focus on research topics that would help policymakers and citizens understand the pandemic's significant economic and policy impacts and guide responsive and responsible policymaking. Forum staff produced 19 different reports in the second quarter on topics ranging from the economic consequences for hard hit sectors, hard hit sectors to the impact of the digital divide on distance learning to the struggles of childcare providers. Today, Rob will discuss another primary area of research for the forum since the spring, which was to assess the impacts of the pandemic on the finances of state and local governments and school districts. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Hankin. For that very nice introduction, thanks President Darren and thanks of course to all of you out there for joining us. I am going to now share my screen. So give me a half a second. There we go. So as Chris said, what I plan to talk about this afternoon are just how the pandemic and the very severe economic consequences that have emanated from it are impacting, uh, first of all, state government and then local governments and school districts across the state of Wisconsin. So believe it or not, I am going to start with some good news. Uh, there isn't a lot of good news to say about the governmental impacts, but um, what this slide is showing us is that uh, at least heading into the pandemic, our state government had, had really seen some progress in terms of being ready uh, for that proverbial rainy day. 
So what we are seeing in this chart, and the forum produced a report on this uh, back in uh, late March. Uh, by the way, all of the research I'm going to be talking about today uh, is available on our website, which is wispolicyforum.org. But what this chart is showing us is a key indicator of um, short-term solvency, of, of ability of a, of a government to essentially meet its payroll, uh, pay its short-term bills. Uh, the lighter blue line is the cash ratio, which is the ratio of cash and equivalents to short-term obligations. The quick ratio includes receivables. Bottom line is, as you can see, this has been trending upward over the past several years. So heading into the pandemic, clearly, uh, this state was in much better shape from a short-term fiscal condition perspective than it was heading into the last recession in 2008-2009. Now, a far more common uh, way of sort of assessing the capacity of a state government in particular to address that proverbial rainy day is to look at its rainy day fund and also its general fund, which essentially is the cash balance uh, cash and equivalents balance, uh, essentially the, the fund balance that transfers from year to year. The rainy day fund is a special fund in which dollars, surplus dollars from previous years can be set aside uh, for that rainy day. So this really paints the picture of the improvement that the state of Wisconsin had shown um, in 2000, by 2019 we can see that it was not only the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 that depleted uh, the state of Wisconsin's reserves. Those reserves were depleted headed into the last recession, and that's a, a reason why it was so painful for state government. We can see that that tide began to turn uh, after 2011, and that um, with each passing year, the state was able to essentially see progress in terms of both its general fund balance and in its rainy day fund. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there was also some dumb luck here. Um, our viewers may recall that state leaders were actually considering uh, taking money out of the rainy day fund or actually out of the general fund balance, um, either to use um, for some expenditure priorities or for some tax cuts. Uh, this was um, a few months before the pandemic hit. Uh, the political log jam in Madison prevented them from taking any action, and I would bet my bottom dollar that state leaders on both sides of the aisle are thankful that in this case political gridlock was a good thing because the rainy day fund uh, and the uh, general fund balance uh, remained at their uh, approximately $1.8 billion level uh, heading into the pandemic. Now, just for one more bit of context, again, while we have seen great progress in this regard at the state level, um, when you look across the 50 states, and the data here are only as good as uh, 2018, but uh, state of Wisconsin still on the low side in the, in the 30s among the 50 states in terms of combined general fund uh, and rainy day fund. One other thing that we wanted to look at in terms of assessing the capacity of state government to weather this very severe storm was the state of its unemployment fund. And here too, um, a, a good news story to tell uh, in that, again, when we, we, we would have expected to see that fund uh, depleted as it certainly was in the years heading out of the Great Recession, but even heading into the Great Recession of the previous decade, the unemployment fund uh, was, was below a billion dollars. As you can see in 2019, as we headed into this pandemic, uh, very close to a $2 billion balance. As we look across the 50 states, that's about uh, sort of the mid-range among the states. Uh, so the good news is much better prepared. The bad news, again, in this case, that the hit on the unemployment fund is just uh, so extreme and so unexpected uh, that here too, uh, in all likelihood, there's going to have to be some federal assistance, not only for Wisconsin, but for all states uh, in terms of weathering this storm. So a big question on the table, and this is a good segue into my discussion of local governments and school districts and the impacts that they're seeing, um, is whether there is going to need to be a state budget repair bill. So the state uh, budget is a two-year budget. The state fiscal year uh, begins on July 1st, so we just entered the second year of the biennium for state budget purposes this past July 1st. And for this coming year, there will be a statutory requirement, as is laid out on this slide, uh, that could require 
state leaders to actually go back into the existing two-year budget, the second year of that budget, and make some reductions. Um, the statutory guideline is that the uh, Secretary of Administration must determine whether expenditures are projected to exceed revenues by more than 0.5% of the estimated uh, general appropriations for that fiscal year. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question yet. Uh, revenue collection data lags real time by two or three months. Uh, we do know that very clearly the state has been taking hits in terms of its sales tax revenues. Uh, we know that income tax uh, revenues are certainly at jeopardy, in jeopardy. And so despite the relatively healthy state of state government's reserves heading into this crisis, there is certainly a chance that there will need to be a budget repair bill. Um, there is talk that if that happens, it may wait until after the election in November. Um, for political reasons, that may make sense. But for practical reasons, the longer state leaders wait, if they are aware that there's going to be a need for a budget repair bill, uh, the tougher it gets to make those repairs because the cuts have to be more severe to generate the types of savings um, in only part of a year that could be generated if um, most of the year is, is still available to generate those savings. And why is that relevant? Well, what this shows, and, and again, we don't know what might have to be cut in the event that state leaders do have to consider a state budget repair bill. Uh, but as this, this lays out the largest um, categories of general purpose revenue expenditures for the state. And you can see the K-12 school aides are the by far the highest on that list which just would make it difficult to the extent that there needs to be a budget repair bill, it could be very difficult to avoid making some reduction to K-12 school aides because of uh, the, the proportion of the state budget that they entail. Um, shared revenues is on the right side of this screen, um, certainly much lower than K-12 school aides, but still one of the half dozen or so major categories of spending. Shared revenues are revenues that the state shares from sales and income tax collections with municipal governments and county governments uh, throughout the state. And so clearly those could be in jeopardy as well. So what this does is it sets me off into a path now where I can talk a little bit more about what some of the impacts might be on school district budgets, on municipal budgets, and on county budgets. Let's, let's start with school districts. And so what this uh, chart is showing you is the way Wisconsin structures the revenue uh, streams that are enjoyed by its public K-12 school districts and how the way, uh, how our uh, means of establishing those revenue structures for our schools uh, differs or is consistent with the rest of the country. So the dark blue bar shows Wisconsin and the percentages of these three primary sources of support uh, for school districts and compares that to the turquoise bar, which is the US average. And you can see that in the state of Wisconsin, our school districts um, on average are more reliant on state aid than the rest of the country and also more reliant on property taxes. So that's sort of an eye in the beholder type of circumstance. Uh, on the one hand, I just told you that uh, K-12 school aides may well be in jeopardy if the state look, needs to look at budget cutting for this second year of the biennium. At the same time, the budget's been set. And so if our school districts, for example, were more reliant on income taxes or sales taxes, which are clearly um, much more volatile in uh, the onset of an economic recession, that might be a bigger problem than being so reliant on state aid. Um, Interestingly, the same is true for property taxes. When we look at the big three categories of taxation for all types of governments throughout the country, it's property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes, and property taxes tend to be the most stable. Not only do any declines in property values that take place as a result of an economic downturn or recession tend to not be nearly as immediate as what we would see in sales and income tax collections, but also because we only do our reassessments and our revaluations of property once a year, that can be a real lag. Uh, and in fact, um, any decline that we are going to see in property values as a result of the current recession, really we won't even know what those declines are until uh, the 2022 budget season for school districts and for local governments. 
So interestingly, while the forum has said a lot about the problems associated with over-reliance on state aid and property taxes, in this case, as we are in the midst of an historic economic recession, um, being that reliant on these two forms of revenue is not necessarily a bad thing. What I'm showing you here in this rather complicated uh, diagram um, is the way we try to assess. If, if we were to look at school districts across the state and just try to gauge what their level of vulnerability was as we now uh, are in the midst of these very unsettled financial times, um, a couple of things we'd wanna look at is that reliance on state aid. And again, because there is a chance that state aids may have to be cut by state government, um, and so we are showing you as a percentage basis for the 10 largest school districts in the state, uh, each of their reliance on state aids as a percentage of their overall revenue. And the other thing we're showing here is what their general fund balance was as of the end of 2018, which can give an indication, not a perfect indication, but an indication of their capacity to absorb fiscal stress in the coming months. Uh, so here's some bad news for the Milwaukee Public Schools. Uh, as you can see, MPS very reliant on state aids when compared to its peers. And um, by far among the 10 largest school districts in the state, MPS had the lowest general fund balance heading into this crisis among those school districts. So clearly some trouble spots there. Just to get into a little bit more detail about what we know about how the Milwaukee Public Schools might be impacted by the economic consequences of the pandemic. Uh, first of all, there's a lot we don't know. Um, what I will say to you is that um, MPS's fiscal year is also July 1st. So MPS also just began its new fiscal year, the FY21 year. Uh, the school board adopted a preliminary budget in late May and that budget, did not include any extra pandemic related costs, nor did it include any new pandemic related federal or state revenues uh, that we already know are coming into MPS. So school board leaders will be revisiting the budget in the fall, despite the fact that the fiscal year has already begun. Uh, we do know that there are certainly going to be extra costs for MPS associated with the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure most of our viewers are aware that the school board recently approved a school reopening plan uh, that for now would rely on virtual schooling. Um, there is a cost associated with that plan of approximately $91 million for items like uh, technology and personal protective equipment and transportation. Um, what we know so far is that the Federal CARES Act uh, is providing about $42 million directly to NPS that could ostensibly be used to offset some of that cost. And the governor just made a decision to allocate about $11 million from a discretionary pool he had. So some of that potential cost may be offset by these special funding sources, but as you can see, there's still a gap there. Uh, if you're thinking to yourself, well, what about the referendum that just passed in April and didn't that give NPS a lot of extra money? Well, indeed, there's about $57 million that MPS will be enjoying because of its ability to exceed state revenue limits. Uh, as a result of the successful passage of that referendum, that will help cushion the blow. Um, it may not fully cushion the blow. And as this bullet point says, uh, those funds were really intended for enhancement. So to the extent that they would need to be used to plug holes, that would certainly not be an ideal situation. Let's shift now uh, quickly to municipal government. So the forum produced a report on the impacts on municipalities shortly after the pandemic hit. Um, again, too soon to really gauge the full impact, but there are a few things we can tell you. What this lays out is the basic revenue structure for municipalities across the state. As you can see, um, very heavy reliance on property taxes. That's certainly no secret, and that's not unlike schools. Lesser reliance on schools, uh, in terms of intergovernmental revenue, the bulk majority of which are aids from the state of Wisconsin, but still some pretty heavy reliance. So again, um, there may be a need to see some cuts there, but these two areas um, relatively stable compared to other major forms of taxation. There's also lesser reliance by municipal governments on things like charges for services and license, license and permit revenue and fine and forfeiture revenue. Uh, I'll get into that in just a minute, 
Um, those are areas that could be hit, but fortunately, as you can see, they comprise relatively small percentages of municipal budgets on average across the state. What we're showing you here, again, we took a look in this case at the 20 largest cities and villages. We highlighted Milwaukee on this slide. Uh, as you can see, in terms of percentage reliance on the property tax, and, and again, property tax reliance, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, delinquent property tax collections certainly are going to be an issue, but those are turned over by municipal governments ultimately to county governments. So from the city of Milwaukee's perspective, being reliant on property taxes is not necessarily a bad thing at this point in time. As you can see, however, Milwaukee's percentage reliance when compared to other large cities and villages uh, is on the low side, but that dollar amount is, is, is still a large dollar amount. Um, what we're also showing you here um, are uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the um, not only the property tax, but again, what those dollar amounts are. So you're seeing the percentage for Milwaukee um, as well as uh, the, the total amount. I, I mentioned public service charges. So what are those? Those are charges that municipal governments charge for things like refuse and garbage collection, ambulance fees, um, solid waste, uh, other solid waste disposal, uh, parks and cultural fees that are, are uh, provided by municipal governments. So uh, this shows you some of the largest ones um, on paper. You wouldn't imagine the things like refuse and garbage collection and ambulance fees would be negatively affected by the pandemic. Uh, others that are tied more closely to parks, culture, and recreation certainly will be. The good news is that uh, as we look across all municipal governments, these are relatively small shares of their revenue. Uh, fines, forfeitures, licenses, and permits. And this is an area where the city of Milwaukee is already taking some considerable hits. Uh, parking fines, for example, simply are not being collected at nearly the pace they were, particularly when we were under a, a safer at home order, as people are simply not driving as much, they're not using their automobiles as much, so they're not receiving as many parking fines, and for a while there, parking fines were even being waived. Um, so the dollar amounts um, can be somewhat significant for big cities like Milwaukee, but as you can see, as a percentage of their overall revenue streams, while these are likely to take a hit, uh, the good news is they're not uh, big components of those revenue streams. Um, room and resort taxes. So this is a form of taxation that municipal governments are allowed to employ. They can levy uh, hotel and motel room taxes of up to 8%. And clearly this is an area that will take a major hit. Now here, Milwaukee has some good news. Milwaukee is actually the one city in the state that is not allowed to levy its own room tax. It, it actually does, but that revenue flows to the Wisconsin Center District. But there are clearly municipalities in other parts of Wisconsin, particularly in high tourism areas like the Dells and Door County, where these governments are very reliant on hotel and motel room taxes, and they will certainly be experiencing some hits. I just want to summarize now about going back to the city of Milwaukee and what we know. Uh, as I mentioned, we already know that the city is experiencing some relatively sizable revenue de deficits as a result of things like uh, inspection and permitting fees. I mentioned parking fines, um, revenues from parking meters and structures are all running significant deficits. Uh, the city budget director has estimated a budget, uh, an overall revenue deficit uh, through August of about $26.5 million for city government. Uh, now the city has responded. There have been furloughs uh, for hundreds of employees and reduced work hours. Uh, certain departments have, ex have, have been exempted. That's expected to produce some savings. And city government, uh, similar to NPS, will be receiving some direct fun funding from the federal government to help offset some of these pressures. Uh, the catch there is that those dollars do have to be limited to pandemic related costs. Um, overall, the city, again, through these um, furloughs and, and other efforts is, is hoping to weather the storm in 2020. I think the far bigger problem for city government is going to be its 2021 budget, where already there's a cost to continue gap projected of about $68 million, as many of these revenue holes are expected to linger. Finally, let's uh, uh, I'm gonna skip this slide and let's turn to counties. 
Um, we also took a look at county governments uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin and tried to say on a, on a relatively high level what the impacts might be on them. Uh, this is the way the, the revenue structure breaks down for counties in the state of Wisconsin. As you can see, very similar to uh, the municipal revenue structure, but with one big exception. Uh, counties in Wisconsin are allowed to levy up to a half cent sales tax, and 68 of the state's 72 counties have indeed implemented a half cent sales tax. And so those sales tax revenues, to the extent that we have county governments that have pretty strong reliance on those sales tax revenues, that's obviously going to be a problematic feature going forward. Uh, this gives you an idea of counties across the state. The bigger the bubble, the uh, bigger the dollar amount in terms of their sales tax collections. Um, and the lighter the shade, um, the lower the reliance as a percentage of their overall revenues. So for Milwaukee County, there's both good news and bad news. It's a uh, relatively small proportion of Milwaukee County's general revenues, but it's a big dollar amount. So a 10, 15, 20% hit on that $79 million that the county had uh, projected to collect in its sales tax revenues uh, from a dollar perspective is, is certainly a significant hit. Uh, public service charges are also an important source of revenue for counties, though they fall below uh, intergovernmental revenues and charges uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, and property taxes. Um, in this case, public service charges often um, are linked to uh, health and human services and Medicaid reimbursement for various uh, behavioral health and disability services, for example, that are provided by county governments. And that's why Milwaukee's is so high. Milwaukee, uh, among the 72 counties, uh, has by far the biggest expenditure burden when it comes to health and human services. Um, so as you can see, heavy reliance on public service charges by Milwaukee County. Uh, the good news, if we can call it that, is that um, these health and human services related charges um, may not suffer very much because of the pandemic. And again, that's not necessarily good news because it means that people need those services. Um, but so far Medicaid reimbursements have uh, remained relatively stable. So that may not be as, as big an issue. Uh, this gives you a sense of the types of per public charges for services uh, the counties rely upon. Uh, here, uh, parks, again, uh, to the extent that we have counties like Milwaukee County that are running uh, comprehensive park systems, uh, their revenue streams are certainly being challenged by the pandemic. Uh, court fees are being challenged because of the changes that we've had to make in terms of the way courts are proceeding. Uh, register of deeds fees are a... Um, a sizable source of revenue for many counties. Those are based on real estate transactions, which clearly have slowed down. So uh, it depends on the county. Uh, zoos, another one here in Milwaukee County. I would imagine that most of that 14.8 million you're seeing is for the Milwaukee County Zoo, even though this is showing it for all counties. And, and those are revenue streams that are taking a hit. So what do we know so far about Milwaukee County? Uh, we do know that a sizable sales tax deficit is projected though my understanding in talking to the county budget director last week is that sales tax collections have picked up. Um, the county is going to suffer more than municipal governments from unpaid property taxes. So they're projecting now about a $9 million hole for the rest of this year. I mentioned parks and the zoo with revenue deficits and the House of Correction. Uh, they board prisoners for the state government and the federal government and they're, they're not doing that as much. So that's a revenue hit. Uh, there's a total projected deficit of about $24 million for this year uh, projected for Milwaukee County. Uh, the good news is that much or all of that may be offset with uh, federal CARES or FEMA revenues. Uh, the county, like the city, also taking a series of corrective actions and also is projecting some savings in its health care expenditures this year. Uh, Milwaukee County has a freeze on hiring. They have frozen spending for overtime and on new contracts and tra travel and training. Uh, they're um, putting a halt to cash financing, any capital projects, and all of those actions are expected to save about $22 million. Uh, the county, like the city, has also uh, furloughed a sizable number of employees uh, to save about $3 million. So again, uh, looking like Milwaukee County will weather this storm 
without any additional corrective actions, and I don't want to minimize the impacts of those that have been taken. Uh, again, as with the city, however, um, the size of the projected budget gap, which is typically in the $20 million range, which is a pretty big problem to begin with, uh, right now is looking to be about double that for 2021. So I'm going to stop there, and I am eager to take your questions. Thank you, Rob. Um, as always, you provide a very comprehensive overview of the, the topic at hand. Um, so it was very helpful. Um, I noticed this morning in the journal Sentinel that um, they wrote about how the hyperpartisanship at the state level has made it very difficult to have a comprehensive state policy that would help us deal with the um, pandemic. And you had some words of advice for our state leaders. Do you want to share those with us right now? Uh, thanks, Mary. Great, great question. And um, talking about hyperpartisanship is always a challenge for me, given our <laughs> uh, fierce nonpartisanship. But in this case, I, I think certain things have to be said. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's very hard to hide, um, you know, my disappointment and, and my sense is a collective disappointment among many and among some of the future governor uh, or former governors you cited and the fact that our state leaders aren't even talking to each other. And one would certainly hope that in a time of such severe crisis, uh, notwithstanding the many gripes that both sides say they legitimately have with the other side, that our state leaders would be getting together and would be discussing potential solutions. And we've, we've seen caseloads begin to increase again. Uh, we are one of the only states that has not at least debated a statewide uh, mask mandate, but even getting away from that very volatile topic. You know, should state government be setting some uh, statewide standards that would provide guidance for all municipal governments and county governments in terms of the response that they need to make to all of this? So. Again, um, one would hope that as this crisis continues to uh, unfold, that we would see our state leaders start talking to each other once again, because I, th I think that's very necessary. Um, yes, thank you. And I just want to encourage people to put their questions into the chat feature. And I believe that Michelle has also changed the format so that we may be able to start seeing some of our familiar faces. I see um, Abby Lank just popped up. Um, and so if you're in gallery view, you should be able to see um, some, some fellow Rotarians. So question in the chat from President Darren, what challenges are the Wisconsin um, public policy facing as an institution these days? Appreciate the, the question, President Barron, and I, I, I think the answer, um, I think a lot of the challenges we are facing are clearly common challenges that are being faced by uh, small nonprofits and even larger nonprofits uh, across the region of the country. Uh, we are very reliant on corporate uh, contributions. Um, about a third of our revenue stream uh, is, is, is membership dues contributions. Um, from a variety of, of corporate entities, nonprofits, institutions, and governments. But clearly it's very tough given the, you know, the chaos and, 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 and just the, the, the big hits that, 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 govern, that, that businesses and, and everybody is taking from this to ask to make these uh, philanthropic contributions to a nonprofit like the Forum. So um, for, for us, and, and again, we are certainly not alone in that uh, regard, um, we are very, uh, fortunate that we have a very generous philanthropic community uh, in this um, uh, in, in this state and in this region that that is really stepping up and that has stepped up for us as well. Um, so we'll get through this just fine. Um, in terms of our, our our programs and and our services, it's been tough. We had a lot of longer term projects we were working on that we had to just set aside. We 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 immediately once this hit wanted to make sure that we could churn out. Uh, research products and insights that would be helpful to policymakers and would be helpful in, in terms of just educating citizens as to what's going on here. And so we pivoted. Um, we've, we're now trying to sort of balance. Uh, not a day goes by that we don't come up with something that we say, boy, we'd love to jump into this and, 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 and publish something on it. Uh, we have some other ongoing work we also have to complete. So it's, it's been a challenge, um, but it's also been kind of fun to try to uh, juggle this. Right. Well, thank you for staying on top of it. Um, I'm not sure where that, somebody is 
Maybe, Michelle, should you put us back on mute? Except for Rob and me? Thank you. Um, so um, given the huge fiscal challenges facing the city of Milwaukee, should city leaders be considering cuts to Milwaukee Police Department irrespective of the calls to defund the department as a means of police reform? Um, we know that there's a, a call out there for a 10% cut that's under consideration. Um, what would that 10% cut mean? Do you have a sense about that? Yeah. So, you know, the, the irony here is that had the tragic uh, death of George Floyd not occurred and the protest not occurred, uh, City of Milwaukee's financial challenges are so great and the Milwaukee Police Department's proportion of the city budget is so great. It's about 48% of the dollars spent by the city's general fund that it would have been impossible, frankly, for city leaders not to be looking at possible cuts to MPD. And I say that with absolutely no position or value judgment on the notion of defunding police for other reasons. But again, just because MPD is such a major share of the city's budget and the city is facing such huge financial obstacles going forward, that was gonna to have to be looked at. Now, the 10% the cut, that's something that the um, Common Council directed the budget director to take a look at and to lay out what that would mean. Um, I think it's very important to recognize that that was not necessarily a show of support by the council for making that 10% cut, but um, a statement that said, look, we, we just need to know what that would look like. And so um, that's still a work in progress is my understanding by the city budget director. I know the police chief has suggested that if you wanted to um, achieve that 10% cut just by cutting sworn officers, that that would be more than 300 sworn officers. Um, which would clearly be have a major impact. There was a cut of 60 officers in this year's budget. Um, but again, I think, um, I, I think this is gonna have to be on the table. And, and one of the real questions that, that, that we're suggesting needs to be asked is whether there may be ways to achieve some reductions in police funding that would not have an impact on public safety. Greater partnership with the county on things like uh, behavioral health issues. Um, uh, I, other uh, ways that, that, that potentially greater cooperation um, between uh, MPD and the Milwaukee County Sheriff and Municipal Police Departments. Are there ways that we could see some of these reductions that, that may not necessarily have to impact uh, the roster of sworn officers and, and the public safety elements? Thank you for that. Um, it's really going to be an ongoing conversation for a while and I would expect that the Wisconsin um, Policy Forum will have some important input um, that will guide some hopefully thoughtful decision making as we go forward in the next year or so. Um, Rob, a question from Francis Vogel. Is there a case to be made that MPS referend referendum money, monies be used in part to help offset the FY21 budget shortfall triggered by the pandemic? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Francis. And, um, you know, it's sort of Beggars can't be choosers. I mean, if, if, if clearly, if, if the outcome of the passage of the referendum is that MPS has greater wherewithal to do distance learning and, and do it well, uh, you know, to invest in Chromebooks and, and wireless connectivity for these poor kids who really need it, that it fills other budget holes that prevent them from having to cut teacher positions um, and expand the size of classrooms then I think my personal opinion is that very few who supported the referendum would necessarily find fault with that. But I think the other side is, again, this is a, a, a big hit on property taxpayers in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, it was passed overwhelmingly, but really part of this was to say, hey, can we get NPS up to the level of suburban school districts uh, in areas like access to art and music yeah. and, and phys ed? Um, and career and technical education, in terms of having smaller class sizes, in terms of doing more for, to, to, to compensate teachers to ensure that the, the best and the brightest teachers can be attracted and retained. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it would be a shame if end of the day, the dust clears and, and those dollars can only be used to fill holes instead of to uh, achieve some of those objectives. Uh, the, there's a lot of tough decisions to be made right now in terms of where money's going to go and um, what are the needs that we really need to focus on in order to get through the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, 
What has the pandemic taught us about how we structure our local governments in southeastern Wisconsin? And should this be used as an impetus to pursue greater consolidation and service sharing? And um, I guess along those lines, I think it's probably good just to remind us about what some of the really stellar examples of service sharing are in our community. Well, there's, there's a saying, Mary, and it's not mine, um, <laughs> but that, um, you know, you don't want to waste a good crisis. Well, right. nobody wanted a crisis of, of this magnitude, obviously. But, but that said, I think, a, I, I think a very important set of questions going forward is around what, what our response to this pandemic and, and the ability of our local governments and school districts uh, to respond effectively to a crisis like this, what, it, what, it, what, what does it teach us about how we do things here? And I think, you know, there's no better example than public health in Milwaukee County. Um, Milwaukee County is um, the only county in which uh, uh, public health is a municipal function and not a county function. Uh, actually, Racine has two health departments, uh, so there's one other small exception. Um, so there is a consolidated health department in the North Shore, um, West Dallas and West Milwaukee do public health together, but there's about a dozen or so different municipal public health departments in Milwaukee County. And so I think it's something to look at going forward is, is, is that really the way that we would ideally want to structure this? and and how did the response to the pandemic in Milwaukee County, um, given that there are all of these public health departments, how did that differ, whether to the good or the bad, from how the response happened in other counties that had county health departments? I, I will say that very early in this crisis, uh, the county and its municipal governments formed an emergency operations center and, and made sure that they really had robust communication taking place uh, among the different health departments in the county and with the county and its emergency management services uh, division and, and its behavioral health division. Um, but, you know, that's a good example of an area where maybe we do have to take a look and use this pandemic as an opportunity uh, to see whether things could and should be structured better. Um, fire and EMS is another perfect example. The fact that we have uh, so many different small municipal fire departments that are providing both fire and emergency medical services and would having more consolidation in that area have provided for uh, any more effective response uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. A, a question here from um, past president Steve. Are there any stats on how much the philanthropic community contributes um, um, in addressing the or, or really matters um, in addressing the current crisis? Are we counting on philanthropy here? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And um, I, we did a report, must have been five or six years ago, that did track uh, philanthropic, uh, philanthropic contributions in the four county metro area, both pre and post Great Recession. Um, so uh, we don't have the data in real time to know what's going on here. Um, I do know that uh, several of the prominent foundations in town have gotten together and set up a special emergency fund that's being used for those nonprofits that are really on the front line of delivering vital services. Um, and they've really stepped up their efforts. So Steve, I, I can't give you a precise answer to your question. I think it is something we're gonna wanna track. And I think also the, the Helen Bader School at, at UWM um, has, um, is, is tracking this and is reporting on this. Uh, but um, I, again, I can say this as a nonprofit leader that, that we have a very generous philanthropic community here that I know in the wake of the Great Recession, philanthropic giving spiked up. You would expect that with everybody losing so much money in terms of their endowments that maybe it, it would have cratered, but it didn't. It was the opposite. It was we have to spend more money as philanthropy to help our community uh, somehow get through this. And I think we're seeing the same thing today. And um, what do you see as the short-term impact, or maybe not short-term, but the next you know, 24 months or so on Milwaukee County Parks? Parks are something that a lot of us in the county worry a lot about. And um, certainly they've been hit uh, with a loss of fees right now. Do you have any thoughts on what's gonna happen with the parks in the coming period of time? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any question, you know, when, when we look at the areas of county government that are most likely to suffer long term, it's, it's parks and, and transit. And um, I think that, and, and so much depends on, um, you know, when right. we get a vaccine and, and when we can get back to some semblance of normal. But it also may be that we never quite return fully to normal, which might suggest, again, that there are going to have to be some big changes made in, 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 in the way that we deliver these services and potentially in the breadth of these services. The, the short answer is the parks are very concerned. They're already looking at a big revenue deficit this year. They already had huge struggles. I, I presented uh, to Rotary not long ago on the um, $400 million uh, infrastructure backlog uh, that is facing uh, county government as a whole. And by far the, the leader uh, in terms of contributing to that backlog are, is the backlog of, of, of uh, infrastructure needs in the parks. Uh, so heading into the pandemic, one could have argued that the parks were in crisis and that real big decisions were going to have to be made either to pursue some form of dedicated funding source, which would uh, likely require state approval or really have to take a look at which parks amenities are just going to have to go away. I, I think maybe the timetable for doing that is, has actually now increased because um, some of these very key revenue streams from golf fees to McKinley Marina fees, um, to people coming to the domes, et cetera, is having a real impact on the fiscal uh, sustainability of the parks. Thank you again. And uh, Rob, um, from Karen Hung, what are some of the upcoming or new areas that you're watching? What, what, what are you keeping your eye on that we haven't talked about yet today? Yep. So one critical area that we haven't talked about is higher education. What yes. is the impact <laughs> of all of this going to be on our UW system, which like many of the other uh, areas that we've talked about was, was already facing some pretty significant challenges before a pandemic completely threw their world into chaos and disarray. So, you know, my sense is that many uh, of you have been following um, already some of the dialogue in the paper. Um, Governor Evers um, has asked for some additional state uh, budget cuts um, even before consideration of a repair bill. Uh, uh, former Governor Thompson, who's now heading up the UW system, is, is asking that the UW system be spared. Um, we are doing a report. We're, we're actually, even before the pandemic hit, we had initiated a research project that was really going to look at the trends in terms of um, the funding for our UW system, the impact that a tuition freeze has had, um, and how our um, way of um, financing and structuring our public university system and our technical college system, how that compares to, to some peer states, peer Midwestern states, and what we might learn. So I think that that's something you can expect our report on that, um, hopefully by October or, or November. And again, it's become even more relevant uh, than it than it previously was. Um, I think the other um, uh, we uh, another issue that we have looked at, which now has taken on some increased prominence uh, as a result of the uh, protests and the um, long overdue. Um, intensified focus on, on uh, eliminating racial inequities in our community is uh, teacher workforce diversity. So as a plank of our education research agenda, we came up uh, with one report on this topic uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we'll have a series of reports looking at what we can do as a state to enhance diversity in our teacher workforce, um, which would both um, be beneficial in terms of uh, educational achievement outcomes, uh, for both uh, white students and students of color, um, as well as um, be an effective workforce development strategy, et cetera. Okay, well, I think that that's all I see in the chat. Rob, thank you. You have such a great um, command of the, the facts and your team does such great work. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm gonna turn this back over to President Darren, but remember that um, uh, we, uh, to our fellow Rotarians that Rob's willing to stay around for a bit and we can uh, all have a bit of a chat through the gallery view of, of Zoom if, if you like. So don't go away. So thank you, President Darren. Thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks, Rob, again, for being here today. It's always fantastic to have you uh, speak to the club. Um, really appreciate the uh, personal look into the work uh, that the Wisconsin Policy Forum is doing. It's a wonderful asset to our city and, and the state. Um, 
hope that all of you can stick around uh, after the formal ending of the program to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, first, I've got a few announcements. Club, uh, club members know that for years, we've made a donation to the Polio Eradication Initiative in honor of our speakers. Over the past decade, our club and club members have donated over $175,000 to this initiative. While Polio Initiative remains critically important, this year we're supporting another great cause. In honor of community leaders like yourself, Rob, who speak to our club members, we'll be making a donation to the YWCA of Southeastern Wisconsin, whose mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Next, uh, tune in this Thursday for our snack program at noon, live on Zoom, where if anyone's interested, they can learn more about me. Looking forward to that. Um, join us next Tuesday to hear from former Secretary of Defense, William Perry. He will discuss his new book, The Button, The Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. Thank you to the Plowshares Fund for arranging this program, another great organization. Uh, the formal portion of our meeting is adjourned, but please stick around with us. We're adjourned. Hello, everybody. Very good. People should be able to unmute Bye. themselves. Yep. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Great, great question. So,